Leadership and uh, Cross Market. So today I'm going to talk about uh, basically on Parkinson disease uh, keeping because I have been told that all of most of the people are from postgraduate training. So what, what we need to do as a general perspective of Parkinsonism or Parkinson disease. So what I'm going to do in my talk today is you know the lot of disorders are the movement disorders. So I will just some initial part to just give a teaser about neurodegenerative diseases. What is a Parkinsonism? And I'll concentrate most of my talk on Parkinson's disease because that is one. Uh, as a psychiatrist, probably you people uh, need to be more careful because it involves a lot of management issues and other things. So, brain aging is a process wherein all of us have to go through a process of aging process where a lot of changes will start taking place. And we all know that with time, we start developing various changes in the brain. And these changes in the brain starts noticing in different types of functioning ability of ourselves. With time, we know that the brain starts shrinking. That is a trophy, what we call it as. And not only that there is a shrinkage of the brain, there is degradation of changes in the neurons, the neurotransmitters, the ability of these neurotransmitters to work with each other. So these type of changes you start noticing there. There is also an ongoing free radical damage starts occurring. There are changes in the blood vessels leading to small, small, small stroke-like episodes which are not clinically appreciable. But over a period of time, there is accumulation of these vascular events occurring over and over the time, which leads to increase in inflammatory process, leads to deposition of end products, more and more, more and more end products which are deposited and they are not getting washed away or taken away by the cleaning system of the brain. So this happens with the every system of the body. Brain is more important for us because that is what we are going to talk about. So these are the changes which all of us have to undergo. But based upon this, we start to develop various set of symptoms. Primarily, we can notice as neurological symptoms into four primary functions. One thing probably is cognitive aspects, memory, because that is what we already remember. The age old saying is that what you call it as in Canada, Arvata Karlu Marlo type. So, what does that mean? With really aging, everyone has recognized that cognitive decline will happen. So, cognitive functioning is one of the primary components of that. Then you have a behavioral issues. That is where your roles will start coming into more and more priority. And we know that elderly people are many times more stubborn. They are not easily understandable. They have their own fixed ideas. That's what you start noticing that. Not only that, they may also have motor dysfunctions and uh, autonomic dysfunctions. These are the primary four components. When you look at the brain as a functioning uh, issue or structure, any problems in relation to these set of functions, we start having various type of problems associated with that. Many times people ask, which set of patients will develop what type of problems? How is it decided? It's very difficult to answer because many times people will come and ask, why did I develop Parkinson's disease? No one had in my family had Parkinson's disease or no one in my family had dementia. Why did I develop? We don't have an answer for it. But what we tell them, there are various factors which are involved in development of this. It can be your genetic changes, what have occurred over a period of time, what type of genetic mutations you have developed over a period of time, and epigenetic phenomena. These are all the things which have come with you when you are born. In addition to this, a lot of external environmental factors start playing a role. It can be the infections what you have, it can be the exposure to various toxins and other things, apoptotic me mechanisms, microbiota, nutritional, all these combined features will decide why one set of person will develop certain type of intervention <coughs> diseases earlier as against other set of person. It may be an arthritis in one person with elderly age, it may be dementia with some other person, or it may be cancer in another person. So it's very difficult to tell, but it's a multifactorial thing what so play a role here in the development of various degenerative diseases. So keeping this in the background, this is the background part of the talk, so you need to know that degenerative phenomena is a general phenomena. It occurs various things, and depending upon our understanding, genetic factors, we start to develop various symptoms. So 
most of my today's talk probably because I'm going to talk about movement disorders here. Yes, that's what you know that. So we are going to concentrate on motor function. I told about four cognitive functioning abilities of the brain. What we look into it, but albeit we are looking from the angle from the motor perspective. It doesn't mean that people with motor dysfunction will only have motor dysfunction. It's a simple example of telling of development of grey hair. We have a grey hair here. What a bit of time all the hairs here become grey. So it's when what symptoms develop early, we try to label them with a different types of names. So what do you mean by motor dysfunction? So when we talk about motor dysfunction, it's a development of slowness in the day to day activities. So people can have tremors, which can be different types of tremors. Any person who is having a pill rolling type of a classical tremors, what you can notice, difficulty in moving their hand, stiffness. They have, they feel that generally their body has become more stiff. Many people feel that shoulders are stiff. Frequently misdiagnosed as frozen, frozen shoulder or something like that. Stiffness is noticed. Then they become slower and slower in their day to day activities. A person who is to take about 10 minutes to take bath or 5 minutes to take bath will now take half an hour to finish bath, 15, 20 minutes extra to take feeding. So all their day to day activities become slower and slower. So they're very kinetic, they become. Tremors they develop, stiffness they develop, their gait starts to change. That is, they become <coughs> unpostural instead. So we call them as a trap feature. That is D for tremors, R for rigidity, A for akinesia or slowness, P for postural instability. So any set of patients who have these set of symptoms, any patient who has these set of symptoms, <coughs> technically we call them as they are having Parkinsonism. Or albeit, it's always everyone tells that a trap is equivalent to Parkinson's disease. So if you have this set of symptoms, you have Parkinson's disease. Because motor dysfunction is always interchangeably used with Parkinson's disease. As far as when you tell movement disorders, first thing anyone will recognize is movement Parkinson's disease than anything else. We albeit there are so many other disorders which are associated here. So the question what arises is people are having trap features. So does all Parkinsonism is equal to Parkinson's disease? Is it the same thing or are you looking at a different set of disorders here? So if you look as a portion of movement disorders or a portion of motor related dysfunction, probably yes, you are 100% right telling that Parkinson's disease is the most commonest motor dysfunction related where they have patients having classical Parkinsonism or trap features to begin with. However, when you start looking into that, probably it was not much of important till the therapeutic aspects of Parkinson's disease came into the world. When the therapeutic aspects of Parkinson's disease started to come into the world, we are able to differentiate people who are responding and not responding. Then we are able to find a set of patients who are not responding to treatment. Then when we went back and go look into them, what is happening to them, we noticed that these are the set of patients who have in addition to the classical trap feature, they also have some other set of symptoms. It may be in the form of cognitive functions, autonomic dysfunctions, or other type of things. So, what we call them, they are having a Parkinson plus syndromes. So, you have Parkinson disease, which accounts for about 80 to 90 percent of the diseases. Then you have Parkinson plus syndromes, where you have similar type of degenerative diseases which are going on, but they are not Parkinson disease mainly because their response to therapy is different. They have, in addition, other type of clinical symptoms which is significantly vary and clinical course is different. That is what we need to keep in mind. In addition to these two things, we also have what we call it as secondary Parkinson's. So secondary Parkinson's track features can be noticed in secondary Parkinson's such as people who are having head injuries, trauma, people who have been exposed to various drugs, toxins, metabolic uh, dysfunctions, infections, post encephalitic sequelae. So there are various things. And probably from the psychiatric perspective, probably drug into Parkinsonism, probably you people will be seeing more commonly as against other type of degenerative. So you need to keep in mind that secondary Parkinsonism can occur. And even though I mean, they contribute for a small percentage of overall trap syndromes, once you remember those things, it's very easy for you to discuss with the patients what is the expectation and what is the outcome. Because many times we tell interchangeably for anyone who is having 
Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease and they may start comparing themselves with various other set of patients. <coughs> when they start comparing with other set of patients, what happening is all apples are not oranges, all not oranges can be apples. So their prognostication differs, outcomes differ, they tell them that person show to this doctor he is much better as against to my relative who has been shown to this doctor not improving. So proper counseling becomes an important role here. So once you have a proper diagnosis, it becomes very easy. Try to tell them what is their diagnosis. It's very easy for them to understand or to <coughs> many people have the ability to go back and read themselves on the internet nowadays. So they will read about their disease as well as to reading about Parkinson's disease and getting more confused about that. So this is where the classification or understanding of Parkinson's disease will help you out. So keeping this as a background of Parkinsonian disorders, uh, why it is important for us to know is uh, each one of these syndromes has certain type of primary involvement of the brain. We always there are all these. Like when you tell about Parkinson's disease, it's a motor function which always predominate initials initially, later on developing to other functions like autonomic. I told the four primary components: autonomic, cognitive, and the behavioral aspects of that. They may be present initially also, but they are lesser extent what you can notice. Then we have multiple system atrophy, wherein in addition to motor, autonomic functions are predominantly involved. Uh, progressive supranuclear pulses, wherein balance, gait and motor are involved in addition to cognition. Corticobasal degenerations, we have cognitive involvement plus motor involvement. And then you have frontotemporal dementias, wherein behavior, cognition and motor are involved. So, Depending upon which is the primary brain dysfunction, we try to classify or try to put them into different diagnostic patterns and this helps us to understand the disease course, prognostic, prognosticating to the injury. That is what you need to keep in mind when you are talking about all these things to the patients. So with all these things, we should stick more into our primary disease that is Parkinson's disease. So we know what is Parkinson's disease, people who are having the classical crap features, we call them as a Parkinson's because it's more of a clinical features what we have noticed. The primary question what arises is how common is Parkinson's disease and what happens here. So if you look into it, the, as the age progresses, the frequency of Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease keeps on building up up to a point that about 60 years, about 1% of the people of general population will have Parkinson's disease. And by age of around 85 and plus, one in two people will have Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. And if they don't have one in two people, if they don't have Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease, then they have dementia. So either they should be on this group or that group. So it is well known with aging, uh, uh, with increase in the age expectancies, all these disorders are becoming more and more common. Currently, the incidence is around 4.5 to 21 per 100,000 with a prevalence of around 31 to 2,500. It's more common in men with Indian population is around 328 per 100,000 and the prevalence is going to double by 2040. That is the full publication because the life expectancy is increasing. That is what we need to keep in mind. And especially among all these things, the, the countries which are in that, you can see India, China, Brazil, these are the countries where it, there will be dramatic increase in the Parkinson's disease patients for next 15 to 20 years up to a point of around 200 to 300 percent. So there will be dramatic outgrowth in number of patients what we are going to see with aging degenerative disorders, especially Parkinson's disease if you look at the form. So what is Parkinson's disease? What are its primary classical features? So I hope you recognize Michael J. Fox and Muhammad Ali here, those who are the main uh, people who have been recognized with Parkinson's disease are when Muhammad Ali has been associated with more of a traumatic or privilegedic Parkinsonism, which is not a primary Parkinson's disease, which, is a, which fits into a group of secondary Parkinsonism. And Michael J. Fox has a classical Parkinson's disease and we have various support groups based, about, based on their names. So clinical features, we can classify them as motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms and how the clinical course changes over a period of time. That is what we need to keep in mind. So as I told you, motor symptoms consist of four trap features. So tremors is the one primary symptoms what all of us acknowledge with patients with Parkinson's disease. 
it is usually classically it is described as a pill rolling resting type of tremors usually about 3 to 7 times this is a classical teaching which we need to remember but tremors can present with variable frequencies it can be action tremors means the tremors which are noticed when doing activities or intentional tremors and people may not have rest tremors to begin with also those are all small group of varieties, but they can have. Currently, we have three different sub classification of tremors. Type 1 is a classic Parkinsonism tremor of uh, 4 to 7 hertz. Type 2, postural and action tremors with fractions of thickness of more than 1.5 hertz. And type 3 tremors, where there is an isolated postural and kinetic tremors with a frequency between 4 to 9 hertz. So, there are various different types of tremors can be noticed. After the classical tremor, what you people should remember is a rest tremors of between 3 to 7 hertz and which affects almost like 70% of the people. Most of the people will have hand tremors to begin with. However, people can also have tremors starting with different parts of the body. It can be jaw tremor, tongue tremor, lip tremor, lower limb tremors, head tremor can be the presenting symptom. So, you, patients can present with various set of symptoms of tremors also to remember with that. Then, the second important feature of probably what we should tell that the one of the <coughs> classical symptoms of Parkinson's disease is development of rigidity. Rigidity is a general sense of stiffness. The ability to, to freely move a joint is reduced. The stiffness is felt uniformly in agonist and antagonist group of muscles, unlike spasticity, which is only in one set of muscles. So here, a set of range of movement in any direction will produce the same type of stiffness, what we see. In a cl classical Parkinson, this is what we call it as cogwheel stiffness. We have seen a cogwheel where they used to take the waters from the wells and put it out. The cogwheel, tuck, 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 so when you move the waist of the wrist, you feel that the, the joint is holding, leaving, holding, leaving, holding, leaving type of sensation. That is called as a classical cogwheel type of rigidity, what you can notice. They can also have a left type rigidity. And there are, and in addition, there are other type of features, what we call it as tidal hand, decreased arm swings, and typical stool posters, which are attributed to the rigidity part of the Parkinson's. The Third important motor feature is related to bradycardia, where people will become more slower, stiffer, and they start taking more and more time to do their activities. Blinking is reduced, there is a reduced arm <coughs> is there, loss of spontaneous movements and gesturings are noticed, drooling is noticed just because they are not able to, select, to swallow the saliva spontaneously, and loss of facial features or a focused face, what we call it. So these are the set of classical features what we notice in the patients with Parkinsonism and then in the posture and gait patients can develop have gait issues, stoop postures, limb deformities, impairment in balance and coordination, they may be retropulse and tend to lose balance backwards when they are walking or when someone tries to push them back easily they are not able to hold their balances, reduced arm swing, shuffling gait, freezing and fascination. So these are the four classical features of motor symptoms what we need to remember when we think about Parkinson's disease. In addition to this, because all these years of the classical teaching of Parkinson's disease was of motor symptoms, motor symptoms and motor symptoms, but we have over the period of time we have recognized so many non-motor features associated with Parkinson's disease. So we can classify these non-motor symptoms into major criteria. One of them is dysautonomia. This autonomia involves sagoria, constipation which can be noticed decades before the clinical development of motor symptoms, urinary problems, sexual dysfunctions, they are very well there but many people don't come forward with these things, orthostatic hypertension, pain, non-specific pain can occur in this set of patients. Then the second set of non-motor symptoms include sleep related issues, these include REM, REM, uh, REM related behavioral disorders, REM sleep related behavioral disorders, insomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness, nightmares, restless leg syndromes. Then, in relation to behavioral aspects, we have cognitive issues, depression, hallucinations, <coughs> development of psychosis are seen as a part of non motor symptoms. And in addition, there are various other non formal physical non motor symptoms in relation to the uh, nutritional aspects, end of life related case, and caregiver support. So, non-motor symptoms, they are currently becoming the bigger and bigger basket of symptoms which needs to be addressed in the patients with the Parkinson's disease. So, 
giving all those things because many times we tend to confuse when these symptoms develop, when they become priority, when they do develop the symptoms. So, what is the standard classical course of the Parkinson's disease? When you look, this is the chart what I am showing you here. Uh, the x-axis shows the time duration where zero is where let us say zero is the point where you have clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Uh, let us tell this early Parkinson's disease and the late Parkinson's disease. Late Parkinson's disease is when you start developing motor complications or developing other non-motor symptoms becoming more and more prior. And prior to that, whether the symptoms develop or how long back the symptoms will develop. The y-axis shows the degree of disability patient may be having with this set of symptoms. So if you look into that, in the prodermal phase, when they are not yet been diagnosed to have, and now retrospectively when you ask the patients the questions, you can notice that non-motor symptoms are present well before the development of Parkinson's disease, so the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. It can be in the form of development of constipation, which can be seen about two decades or three decades prior to the development of Parkinson's disease, REM sleep disorders, excessive daytime sleepiness, hyposmia, depression, these are all develop well before the clinical symptoms are done. Then, as the time progresses, pain, fatigue, cognitive impairments, orthostatic hypertension, that's autonomic dysfunction, starts more and more prominent as the time starts going up. When the motor symptoms develop, the initial part of the motor function is primarily related to the trapped features. However, as time goes by, the axial symptoms, that is in relation to the speech, balance, swallowing, start taking the prominent role. These set of symptoms do not respond well to the dopaminergic therapies, leading to motor complications, falls, freezing of gait, and fascinations become more and more prominent. So then we have wearer issues. Albeit patients can have various type of wearer issues in early part also, but as time starts going up further and further, uh, psychosis, hallucinations become more prominent with the further progression. This one chart will show you what is the clinical course of a an average Parkinson's disease patient. But in general, what we can tell, an average Parkinson's disease has a clinical course of about 15 to 20 years. But what we need to remember is, later the age of onset, faster these symptoms will develop. Earlier the age of onset, later the symptoms. So usually, the life expectancy of a normal patient is not reduced significantly. Whatever their familiar life expectancy is there, probably the life expectancy will try to remain somewhere around that. A few years plus or minus it can be. That's what we need to try to remember when we are counseling the patients. Or many people come with the question that, what is the life expectancy? What will happen? Or five years will need a bit of bed pump. If a 20 year old patient comes and asks you that, you can tell them, no, nothing will happen for you. You can have a normal life that will about 60 without worrying about it. So that you need to understand when you are talking to the patients. So, with this as an aspect, what do we know about Parkinson's disease? We know the clinical features, we know what, what, the, what does Parkinson's or Parkinsonism is. What, are the, what causes Parkinson's disease? What is the primary goal of this? So, if you look in the genetic aspects, how much we know, genetics play a very small role here. Whatever we have understood about from genetics is by a small subset of patients, but they have played a major role in understanding the pathophysiology of Parkinson's. When the first diagnostic criteria came in 1993, they told that patients with Parkinson's disease, the criteria should include, the criteria included that patients with Parkinson's disease should not have a family history of Parkinsonism. So, clearly ruling out any genetic component in the development of Parkinson's disease. However, soon following that, by 96-97, poly, uh, polymeropolis came with the first unequivocal proof of genetics in the Parkinson's disease, and after that, by 2015, we are having now 28 chromosomal regions related to Parkinson's disease, 9 monogenetic forms have been described, and family history of Parkinson's disease is noticed in about 10% of the patients with Parkinson's disease. So, there is a significant change has occurred over the last 20 to 25 years, the way it was described in 1993 to as of today. So, what happens? What are the changes what we notice? What are the risk factors associated with the development of Parkinson's disease? If you look into it, the various environmental factors are, which can increase the occurrence of Parkinson's disease are pesticide exposure, prior head injuries, rural living, beta blocker usage, agricultural occupation, and well water drinking. These are which increases the odds ratio for development of Parkinson's disease along with the genetics and epigenetics. And something which can reduce is 
smoking, coffee drinking, NSID usage, calcium charter, uh, channel blocker usage and alcohol consumption. So very interesting that something which is going to smoking and alcohol is one thing which is going to reduce the uh, occurrence of Parkinson's. And yes, there are various genetic genes which are involved and uh, which increases the risk factors and there are some genes which are also involved in reducing the risk for development of Parkinson's. So we need to know what are all these things and what happens currently the question is whether the Parkinson's disease starts in the brain only. Now the postulations have become more and more, it is a more of an environmental for the, some type of a slow prion type of a disease. So it is starting some environmental factors, the disease starts early. The BRAC and BRAC staging of which helps in detail about this, is the Parkinson's disease, the initial set of symptoms are noticed in the pathological amount is the periphery of the not in the brain. You notice the the development of living bodies, living pathologies in the peripheral nervous systems, olfactory systems, medulla, vagal system, all indicating that something is starting in the stomach, something is happening there. From there, things are moving back retrospectively through the vagal nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, to the medullary connection. Once it goes through, that is what we call a stage one, it starts to grow up to the, towards the other parts of it. In stage two, pons is involved, including the locus cellulus and then spinal cord gray matter is involved. Then in the stage 3, we also start to have the involvement of the basal forebrain and limbic system. Stage 4, we have development in the involvement in the limbic system in addition to the frontal cortexes we start to have. And stage 5 and 6, multiple cortical regions are involved including insular cortex, association cortical, cortical areas and primary cortical areas. So these are the standard pathological classification where you can notice that the Parkinson's disease starts in the periphery of the body and then starts slowly getting uh, ascending into the brain from the brain stem going into the neocortical areas. So these are the standard classification of BRAC, the BRAC staging of the Parkinson's disease what we need to understand. And overall the classical pathological findings should be Le Levy pathology aggregation in the brain along with loss of dopamine neurons at the subtension angle and pass complex. So, how to diagnose? Is there a way to diagnose? Many people come and ask you that doctor didn't do anything and he told I have a Parkinson's disease. There's no Google per se is the answer for most of them. But when you look into things, we have a diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease. So, the 1993 diagnostic criteria that is UK Parkinson's disease brain man <laughs> diagnostic criteria which is still holds good. It has a three steps for diagnosing. Step one is to diagnose in Parkinson's that is patient should be having those trap features. Patient who is having tremors, muscular rigidity and postural instability. Most important is bradykinesia. Bradykinesia plus any one of them should be there to tell that yes, this patient is having Parkinson's. Then we have step two where we have an exclusion criteria. Means patient should not have repeated strokes, head injury, encephalitis, exposure to drugs, toxins and Previously, there was there more than one affected relative. Currently, it has been uh, taken off from that list because we know that now it has become genetic form of Parkinson's disease are there. Patients who are sustained remission, severe autonomic involvement to begin with, early dementia, optilogaric crisis, cerebellar features, and supranuclear gaze pulses and tumors are the exclusion criteria. You need to look for patients whether they have these set of uh, symptoms which help us to make a diagnosis. Then, they should have uh, supportive or a prospective positive criteria means it should be unilateral onset, slowly progressing. You can't tell if anyone has a Parkinson's disease if it comes and tells you that for last 10 years I have tremors of one and it is like that only without any change or without any development of any symptom. So it should be progressive. It, there should be some asymmetric can be there initially but later on patient will have more of a symmetrical environment. Patient should have good liver dopa response. That is one of the primary point when you diagnose Parkinson's disease. They may have side effects in relation to medications, but if they don't have good response to liver dopa means the question of Parkinson's disease will always be. So this is where when it comes to clinical, when you look into it, most of them are clinical based diagnosis and that's when you can tell. But can we have any lab test where we can do it? Yes, there are various tests which lab tests are involved, but they are mostly limited to research basis, understanding of the Parkinson's disease, development of biomarkers of Parkinson's disease. If you have a strong family history, yes, we have genetic testing for Parkinson's disease, for a known mutation, 
then we have clinical because you can look for affective development, when sleep is These are not specific but can give a diagnosis. But imaging wise, the PET studies, that is, uh, fluorodopa studies and the TRIDOT studies currently are used regularly to diagnose Parkinsonism. They can't differentiate between different types of Parkinson's disease unless until they do a specific receptor related studies, which is not available in most of the labs across India or most of the global. Only few research labs are able to do those type of studies. So even if you ask for CODAT scans or FDG PET studies, you should understand that these tests are to tell you that whether a patient is having dopamine deficiency, whether a patient is having Parkinsonism. It will not help you to differentiate whether it is Parkinson's disease as against anything else. So, how to manage patients with Parkinson's disease? We know now know the clinical features, we know what pathological changes occur, what genetic components are uh, uh, involved in this, and how to test these things. So when you come into the treatment part of the Parkinson's disease, when you look into treatment, initially we didn't have any treatment for Parkinson's disease. Probably in 1870 when the first full description of Parkinson's disease on SUF taking came, the major breakthrough, albeit anticholinergics came between 1880s and 1900s, the major breakthrough in therapeutics, the introduction of Leodop, which was path breaking or changing the direction from a disease where you to just diagnose and you will like, tell that nothing can be done like the current status of motor neuron disease. Like you diagnose motor neuron disease, you just diagnose. You can't do anything, you can. You can show empathy to them, you can talk to them, but nothing major you can do there. In 1963 was a path changing treatment. Levodopa came, completely changed the way we look into Parkinson's disease. That is when the different type of Parkinson's syndrome started to come into role. So that is what came in 1963. Then in 1970s, uh, Dopa decoupled inhibitors came leading to the Reduction in the requirement of levodopa, dopamine agonist came in 1970s, uh, 1980s bromocryptin, ergot agonist, 1990s synthetic agonist started to come into role, DVS came into role in 1990s, and in 2000 various other added drugs have been. There are various cancer therapies are going on from 1990s, but currently till now we don't have any approved stem cell therapy for Parkinson's disease. Because this has become more important because Indian countries there are of quite a few centers, they advertise themselves are telling that we do stem cell therapies, we cure them, paper ads come, to, patients will come back and ask to you. So I saw here that you have one patient telling that he has recovered from Parkinson's disease after undergoing stem cell therapy. Currently, there is no approved indications, there is nothing which has proven unequivocally that Parkinson's disease can be cured. So that we need to understand here. So these are the various set of treatments uh, which are evolved over a period of time. But in what status of Parkinson's disease, what type of treatments are <coughs> useful for us and how do we use them? So in the pre programmable phase, like when the molecular mechanism starts, let us say like you have a pregnancy of Parkinson's disease, you don't have symptoms today and you get your genetic testing done and you are positive. Like for example our Google co-founder. So he has lab 2 mutation positive, his mother has Parkinson's disease. So can we treat him as of today? No, we don't have anything because molecular mechanisms have started, but as of today, we don't have anything which can change in the treatment of that. Then comes the prodermal Parkinson's disease. Means later, we know now when the clinical stages of Parkinson's disease are like that, but we now know the prodermal in the constipation developed and other things are known. Can we do something to delay the development of Parkinson's disease? Can we do something to stop the progression of Parkinson's disease? Here also, we don't have much of symptom based. A lot of studies are being done at this point of time to reduce or change or what you call it as neuroprotective mechanism, disease modifying therapies are now being concentrated at the prodromal Parkinson's disease to pick up the patients as early as possible and start intervening them so that the development can <coughs> stop. So this is where the stop is done. Most of our treatment starts at early but stable Parkinson's these are the set of patients who have very good, good response to dopamine therapies. They can have live near normal lifestyles without any problems. Lot of dopamine therapies are available, which helps them to have a better quality of life. Then once this crosses, we have a motor complications and unstable phase. This is a phase they have a response to medication, but are limited by the frequency of medications what they need to take. The side effects of medication, that is development of dyskinesias. So patients have on-off phenomena, development of dyskinesias, this becomes a major concern. Most of the time it is lost in taking medication. This is the phase when we tell surgical therapies, DBS is the preferred way of management for the management of 
this set of questions. Then after that we have advanced Parkinson's disease wherein it is predominated by motor or increased off symptoms, non-motor symptoms such as dementia, non-motor fluctuations, nighttime sleep issues, hallucinations, repeated falls, dependency for most of the day-to-day -day activities and wherein more of the supportive care comes in. Then finally we have stage a palliative care which comes to any type of a degenerative disease that is where we take it. So there are various stages out of this the middle two stages are the one where we have very good therapeutic interventions which dramatically changes the quality of life of a Parkinson's disease patient to have a better quality of life at least for about 15 to 20 years with these therapies what are available with us now. And we hope that things will become better. So most of us are also keen to know what is the DBS also. So DBS is a process, it's like a cardiac pacemaker, we put an uh, electrode into the brain and depending upon which part of the brain we stimulate, we get an effect or a side effect or we suppress or we increase the, the way that part of the brain is working. So it was a repeaters finding as we know that. So we have done DBS, what happens DBS is electrical stimulation, go and stimulate a deeper part of the brain, so we call it as a deep brain stimulation. Most commonly we use subthalamic nucleus to target, but we also have other targets which we use for management of Parkinson's disease. And the right side video shows you the how the EBS was. The patient was off, severe tremors as soon as the on machine within about few seconds, dramatic reduction in the tremors. So it dramatically changes the quality of it. Initially they have a first wind phenomena with medications of good improvement. Then they start having limitations with medications. Then you have a second wind phenomena with the surgical therapies with dramatic change in the quality of life. So there are a lot of things which are available to manage with the Parkinson's disease. So before I conclude, uh, so just a paradigm of treatment for Parkinson's disease for you people to remember is that in early part of the Parkinson's disease, uh, we have neuroprotective or disease modification therapies wherein uh, level A evidence is available for MAOB inhibitors, Europa and dopamine agonists, level B evidence is available for anticoagulants and MAOB. So any patients with initial set of uh, symptoms, we can suggest them to start on this, but doesn't mean that we need to start unless until they have their quality of life is affected. Then as the pre-symptomatic to symptomatic phase develops, uh, where PD is uncomplicated, there are various therapies are available, anticholinergics for tremor dominant Parkinson's disease can be started, they have small motor effects, but however you should remember that anticholinergics are limited by the cognitive and neuropsychiatric side effects. Levodopa is well accepted, first line of treatment for all patients with Parkinson's disease, but a lot of side effects in the form of excessive daytime sleepiness, sometimes people can develop dopamine dysregulation syndromes. Uh, initially, nausea, vomiting, uh, and blood pressure fluctuations can be developed in this set of patients. Amantadine is also used as a one of the first line of treatment, but amantadine has a different uh, uses in different phases of management of Parkinson's disease. Uh, initially, it helps in improvement of Parkinsonism, insomnia, edema. It is limited by development of insomnia, edema, headache, nightmares, confusion, GI dysfunction, and liver reticularis. Because we should also know the side effects of any drugs when we are prescribing them. And dopamine agonists are well accepted therapies, but they are limited by significantly by dopamine dysregulation syndromes, uh, either it may be form of excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, funding behaviors. Uh, and hypersexuality and so many other things which you can develop with the dopamine. We should be very careful when you start with dopamine. Make sure you ask the questions every time they come. Many times they feel that patient is happy. They are just spending money. They are now feeling happy. They have the related moods. When you ask to the relative, they tell them, sir, I remember, I remember one of the patients I in Canada brought 10 Louis Vuitton bags, which they can buy one bag. I understand they have. They are well off people, but just went and bought 10 Louis Vuitton. They think of, we don't have a reason why they never used to buy like that. So a lot of things what can happen. So then coming to the uh, advanced stage of management of Parkinson's disease, this is where the liver dopa remains the crux in the management of Parkinson's disease. In addition to dopamine agonist, comp inhibitors, amantidine and surgical uh, role in terms of uh, DBS. Then in uh, non-motor complications when they develop all these patients, depending upon what type of symptoms they have, they may require cholinesterase inhibitors, memantine, SSRIs, tricyclic inhibitors, atypical antipsychotics, 
Prodro Partisan for autonomic dysfunction, for contribution to insulin, for airtime dysfunction, cylinder pain, sleep issues, mode of energy, chronic pain. So, depending upon the symptom based approach for non motor symptoms, there are various set of drugs we use for different set of patients, what is required. In addition to all these things, physical therapy is the primary goal, good cue training, least involvement techniques, physical therapies from day one you diagnose, you tell them you need to maintain a scheduled physical activity routine in your life. This will help you to postpone the development of complications, postpone the development of issues, postpone the requirement of more and more dopaminergic therapies in a shorter duration of time. Very important, very crucial. Many people, many patients tend to overlook it. They have just a belief that only to take a medication and everything will become better in life, in life, which is not a truth in neurodegenerative disorders, especially. With this, I finish my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot.